Praise be Jesus and Mary. Yesterday we celebrated the feast of the triumph of the cross. And so today the church puts next to that feast the feast of Our Lady of Sorrows to show Our Lady's participation in that triumph. It was the prophet Isaiah that foretold that the Messiah would be the man of sorrows. That is, he would have much to suffer. And so Our Lady, being the mother of the Redeemer, she too would share in that sorrow and be Our Lady of Sorrows. So in the Catholic world, there are churches dedicated to Our Lady under different titles, different devotions, Immaculate Conception, Assumption, Mother of God. And so it was chosen to dedicate this retreat center to Our Lady under the title Mother of the Redeemer. Okay, that's how we um, have devotion here to Our Lady under this aspect in particular as her role as Mother of the Redeemer, her son under this aspect of Redeemer of the human race. And the friary that is built just behind the church here is dedicated to Our Lady Co-Redemptrix. Okay, two different ways of kind of saying the same thing. The Second Vatican Council in its document on the church dedicates a chapter, chapter eight, to Our Lady, to talk about Our Lady. And one of the sections of that chapter talks about Our Lady's role in the economy of salvation. So this is beginning with paragraph 55. It's the role of the Blessed Mother in the economy of salvation. And what, is the, what do these following paragraphs talk about? They talk about how Our Lady has a unique role, okay, a place like nobody else in the redemption of the human race. And this was not out of necessity, but by the will of God. The father simply wanted it this way. He decreed that his son would be born of a woman in the fullness of time, and that she would have a role to play in this redemption. First and foremost, giving her yes to that call, that vocation to be the mother of the redeemer. So this is paragraph 56 says, the Father of Mercies willed that the Incarnation should be preceded by the acceptance of her who was predestined to be the mother of his son, so that just as a woman contributed to death, namely in the person of Eve, so also a woman should contribute to life. And so Christ, as St. Paul teaches us, is the new Adam. Okay, he now has headship of the human race. And Our Lady is the new Eve. And just as Adam had primacy of place in the fall, okay, Eve certainly, she contributed without a doubt. But it was first and foremost Adam because he's the one who had headship. And so it makes a lot of sense in God's plans that for the redemption of the human race, there would also be a new Adam and a new Eve. Our Lady's role, not having primacy of place, okay, it is certainly secondary, subordinate to, and dependent upon our Lord's role, but nevertheless, it is a real and active role in the redemption of the human race, and it is not merely passive. Notice Our Lady in saying yes at the Annunciation. Okay, she is the Queen of Prophets. Do we have some doubt that she did not have special enlightenment in reading the sacred scriptures in which she heard at the synagogue? Now, she understood very well. She had to understand at least to a sufficient degree for her yes at the Annunciation to be valid. Okay, she accepts to be the mother of the man of sorrows. It's just like when two people profess their marriage vows. 
or when religious profess their religious vows, there needs to be sufficient knowledge of what's going on or those vows are invalid. And so when the archangel announces to Our Lady what she is called to be, her vocation, she has to have sufficient knowledge of what's going on here, not only to be the mother of the Redeemer, but to be the mother of the redeemed. And so she says yes, in this unique cooperation with her son in the redemption of the world continues throughout her life, just as our Lord was redeeming the human race right from the moment of his incarnation. Now, of course, it found its climax and culmination on Calvary, but his whole life was one act of redeeming. Every sigh, every glance toward his heavenly Father had redemptive value. And so the same thing with Our Lady. As she is caring for our Lord, as she is nourishing him, as she is raising him and bringing him up, all of the sufferings and sorrows in doing that, never mind the seven sorrows that we celebrate in a particular way, that the church has approved and that we'll be praying this afternoon. Never mind all of that contributing to the redemption. So there is a union of the mother with the son in the work of salvation. This is paragraph 57. And this is manifest from the time of Christ's virginal conception all the way up to his death. This is the life of the Redeemer and the co-redemptrix all the way through. And so Our Lady throughout her life advances on her pilgrimage of faith up until the moment of Calvary, okay? This is where it reaches its consummation and fulfillment. Again, uh, this document on the church says, she presented him, that is Jesus, to the Father and was united with him by compassion as he died on the cross. And so we meditate on our Lord's passion, of course, and we can also meditate on Our Lady's compassion. We can meditate on our Lord shedding his blood for the salvation of the world, and we can meditate on Our Lady shedding her tears for the same end. In this singular way, notice, like nobody else, because of course we all are called to cooperate not only in our own salvation, but in those of others. And we can do that precisely because we are incorporated into Christ by means of baptism. But Our Lady, in a singular way, she cooperated by her obedience, faith, hope, and burning charity in the work of the Savior, in giving back supernatural life to souls. Notice, not just one soul in particular, but the whole human race. Wherefore, she is our mother in the order of grace. And so we turn to Our Lady today to honor her sorrows. We strive to console her sorrowful and immaculate heart, as was asked at Fatima. And as we see Our Lady of Fatima, her heart surrounded by thorns, she's seeking for us, her children, to console her sorrowful and immaculate heart. By doing what? By imitating her. By being faithful, obedient, hoping in eternal life and having burning charity for the salvation of souls. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>